Hello, uh, good morning everybody. Uh, my name is Astrid Van Lant. I'm the uh, European luxury goods correspondent at Reuters, uh, the news agency, and I'm very happy to welcome you this morning, very early this morning for, uh, for some of us. Um, and I have the uh, pleasure of uh, introducing uh, a very uh, rich and diverse panel this morning. Um, the theme is a new paradigm, how things have changed and where are we going in, in China and, and in the entire region. Um, and I would like to start, I'll just briefly introduce everybody. We have here Guillaume de Seine, who's really, <clears throat> I think, one of the luxury industries, kind of say, biggest veteran, um, man who uh, knows a lot about uh, what has happened and also has an interesting vision about where it's all going. So I'm very pleased to meet him this morning. Um, then we have Arnaud Ribot, who's sitting right next to me. He's the uh, Vice President of Global Sales and Marketing of Citroën's DS model, which I think can also be regarded as a fashion statement car. I don't know if you know the DS, but it's kind of this cool model that Citroën uh, created a few years ago, and you can tell us a bit about that. Then we have here Christophe Case, who's um, uh, the Cosio of Albatros, which gathers and analyzes uh, data about shoppers uh, uh, for brands. And um, we have Andrea Panconesi, I hope I'm, uh, uh, who's here, yes, who's um, founder and CEO of online fashion retailer Luisa Viaroma. Yes, that's right which uh, makes 100 million euros in annual sales, is that what you told me? And uh, for which China is its second market after the United States. So I just wanted to briefly uh, introduce. Uh, and then uh, the famous Erwan Rombourg, I love to call him like that, the author of this book called The Bling Dynasty, uh, Why the Reign of Chinese Luxury Shoppers Has Only Just Begun. Fascinating book, and he's going to share us a bit about... Um, what is in there, and then finally, not last but not least, Davide Vassena, Vice President of Product and Marketing at Vertu, the British maker of high-end mobile phones, who's sitting right here. So <clears throat> I'm going to start with uh, Monsieur de Seine, and um, I would like to. Uh, <coughs> he's going to. You're going to show you also, show us also a few uh, a few photos, and I think it would be wonderful if you could tell us about um, about Hermès's experience in China and uh, how it's evolved, and what are your ambitions there? Okay, with pleasure. Um, well, I don't know if it's because I am the veteran that I am starting first, but nevertheless. Um, Hermès has uh, started in China, uh, not especially early, not especially late. I've been a little bit like everybody else in the luxury. In 1997, by opening uh, at that time a store, in the um, then uh, Palace Hotel in Beijing, which is now the peninsula. Uh, we have taken our time to develop the brand, uh, but today we have uh, 23 stores in China, uh, having had, uh, I would say, a step-by-step -step approach, which is what we like to do things, how we like to do things. Uh, Hermes is always as a family company, uh, always looking at the long-term perspective of everything. So we didn't rush the, 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 the business in China. We didn't rush the, the things. And our biggest challenge was, uh, I think, that, of course, China being a completely uh, virgin market for luxury, all customers there are discovering the brands and having absolutely... Uh, they, they, they catch up, they, they caught up very quickly, but having no special knowledge of, of any brands uh, 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 and everybody um, coming on that market from our, our universe, the challenge was to, of course, uh, um, be able to tell what is Hermes, to tell about our specificity, to tell about our history, to tell uh, the customers about our craftsmanship, uh, about the quality which is behind the brand, all what makes what we believe uh, Hermes unique. Um, and what is interesting uh, in terms of evolution, and I think that uh, is, this is a subject for, for further questions, maybe after, after uh, in the course of this debate, but it's obvious that the sophistication, the growing sophistication of the Chinese customers is extremely uh, impressive. Of course, it's coming um, 
it's mostly in the oldest cities for luxury, which are uh, Beijing, Shanghai, uh, maybe uh, Guangzhou, and uh, and, and generally the, the uh, east part of, uh, of China. But this uh, growing sophistication, um, the fact that very quickly, and, and it was fascinating for me, I've been traveling to China since 98 uh, for Hermes. Uh, it was fascinating to see um, how quickly the press, uh, but also the customers, were... Um, learning things, we're uh, starting to be really discerning about Hermes specifically, but about uh, uh, other brands. And, and my first interviews there in 99 or, or 2000, uh, I, I went to open the second store of Hermes in Shanghai, Plaza 66, in 2001. Uh, I was really impressed by the, the, the depths of the knowledge of the journalists, the fact that they were able to talk to me about my great-grandfather, I'm from the Hermes family, the great, my great-grandfather, and didn't he do this in such year and so on? That was really impressive. So that, that really appetite for, uh, for uh, uh, learning fast and knowing more about, uh, spe enfin, especially about luxury. The customers have been also more and more discerning, more and more sophisticated. And uh, what I wanted to show to uh, illustrate that evolution is that uh, our last, um, our latest uh, store, with, we opened in uh, September last year, uh, we had the project, it was a long project to realize, so we started this project in 2007, um, was to have a, what we call at Hermès a maison, Hermès maison, which means not only a store, not only a large store, but really something uh, here, it's a whole building, um, really to assess the personality, the specificity of Hermès, and generally, together with a store, we have also uh, some cultural space where we are able to organize exhibition, to organize any events, and so on. So we opened that Maison Hermès in a year, 2014, where um, most of the luxury colleagues uh, didn't invest so much, so that was quite well noted. Uh, and we choose to have four, Ch it's in Shanghai, four Shanghai, uh, an old building, it's 1912. It used to be in the French uh, district, so it used to be the, the police headquarters of the French district. Uh, so it's in a certain way, a historical building. Uh, which, of course, um, first established a, a real difference of Hermès because most of the colleagues of the, the competitors and ourselves or other stores are in malls where it's a bit more difficult to really um, differentiate yourself from the others. Of course, we work on the architecture, we work on the window, but, but here it's really a clear statement and it's also a way to say to the Chinese customers, um, Yes, we have in China a beautiful store, large store, as beautiful as the Paris historical store, as beautiful as the New York Maison or the Tokyo Maison, uh, which I think uh, was really the idea of uh, matching that growing sophistication of the, of the Chinese customers. Uh, I didn't look at my watch, you said 10 minutes. Um, I wanted to talk uh, about another initiative that we took, uh, which is Shanxia. I don't know if this name is familiar with you. Uh, Shanxia is a Chinese brand that we launched uh, something like five or six years ago, together with a Chinese lady, uh, Jiangge. Um, and the idea there, which it's completely unique in the history of Hermes. We have never done, done that anywhere else. And I don't... I would not say it's a strategy. We are not going to do the same in India or in, uh, uh, I don't know, uh, Africa. Or It's just that we met that lady who was in charge of uh, our windows in China. Um, and in fact, the, the, the discussion was about what has been said in the introduction by Jean-Pierre Raffarin. Of course, everybody knows that China is a very old civilization, but it's also a country of very 
extraordinary know-how craftsmanship. And of course, with the period of uh, Mao, the Cultural Revolution, all this has been a little bit forgotten. And the idea there is to have a brand which completely Chinese, it's not called Hermès, it's not sold at Hermès, it's, uh, it's completely separate, but the idea is to have a brand with the same philosophy as Hermès. That means creativity, contemporary, uh, and uh, based on exceptional uh, craftsmanship. And uh, we have today, so you can see here a few examples of the products that this uh, brand is proposing. Of course, uh, a lot of um, tableware, china, uh, some really beautiful um, garments, some beautiful piece of furniture, sometimes uh, related to um, craftsmanship which have nearly disappeared in China. Really, some of the, of the objects are made by very, very small teams. Uh, sometimes even only one person is a, uh, is, 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 um, has the knowledge about this specific craftsmanship. And um, here it's a, a bag uh, that they launched last year. Uh, and you see some examples of the like shawls or um, accessories, textile accessories. And, and Shanxia today has really <coughs> met, um, enfin, has really uh, uh, um, met the interest of especially the Chinese customers. Uh, the Chinese press is, of course, has been following this initiative um, with a lot of interest since the beginning. Uh, today we have four stores for Shanxia. One in Shanghai, which uh, it was the first picture, and which is next to the Maison Hermès, which also opened uh, last September. One in the Shanghai airport, domestic airport, one in Beijing, and one in Paris, which where the business is a bit more uh, difficult because I'm not sure that the French customers quite understand the, um, the, the ID. And it's not cheap, it's, it's really expensive. So. Maybe in the mind of the Parisians, uh, Chinese product means uh, lower price. So it's a bit more difficult, let's say. Uh, but Changxia is really an interesting initiative. We have no plan for the future. We don't know if uh, in 20 years we will have uh, 100 stores of Changxia, or if we will, we will still have four stores, or if we will have closed down everything. Uh, that's really a, a bet, but, but the, 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 the objects are beautiful and the creativity is strong. Um, I just, uh, sorry, yes. no, uh, no. I'd like to, um, because the, indeed time is running, uh, could you tell us what you think will be your biggest challenge in China in the next 10 to 20 years? How do you see it evolving? Uh, I don't have a crystal ball, so in the next 20 years, I don't know. But the, of, uh, of course, the challenge today and for the coming years of course, there is this new policy of the central government, uh, which has hurt uh, a lot of brands, including ourselves in some of our businesses, mm -hmm. like watches, mm -hmm. which mm -hmm. typically were, uh, uh, were um, uh, typically a gift, um, <coughs> of, of, uh, uh, which has more or less disappeared. No, the biggest challenge is always the same, is to uh, be perceived as a different brand, a different... Um, uh, philosophy and mm -hmm. that the people share that philosophy, understand it. Um, we still have had a very good year in China last mm -hmm. year with a double digit growth. Um, so One of the few luxury brands I'd like to say. It seems, it seems. <laughs> um, but uh, I think the challenge is really to, uh, to continue building the brand in China. Of course, there will be ups and downs and continue to, to build it uh, in depth. Okay, great. Thank you very much for uh, this very interesting presentation. Um, and now we're going to move on swiftly to another world, the world on wheels, uh, of uh, the DS car with Arnaud Ribot, uh, who is going to tell us about uh, the DS car's uh, history in, in China. Um, I think it's, also, it's really interesting to hear about the early days. Can you tell us about the early days and how you, know, you found your place? And uh, I think maybe people would also be interested in hearing how perhaps the Chinese market is quite different from any other market and what has been the challenge for you there? Thank you. Okay. 
First of all, uh, congratulations for La Maison uh, Hermès. I was in the opening ceremony in September. It's a great <laughs> place, so I invite everyone here to discover this place, and especially as well Shangxia. So just uh, in our approach of the Chinese market, just for you to know, each time um, we have um, management from PSA Group coming, usually we go to visit Shangxia and to uh, show them what is uh, this uh, unique approach. It's extremely interesting. It's linked to our own business as well. It's uh, how you have, uh, uh, it's more than integrated the market when you do something like this. And uh, the objects you propose there are extremely uh, beautiful. So I think the problem of price is not an issue. <laughs> Don't worry for that. <laughs> um, so just the yes, in fact, um, PSA, uh, just to, to, to explain the context, uh, the group PSA um, decided uh, within Cit Citroën brand in 2010 to create a line of cars, a new line of cars, the DS line. It was inside the brand Citroën with uh, three models, DS3, DS4, DS5. That was in 2010. And um, it started with the DS3 extremely well. In the same time, in uh, 2010, we decided to launch a new joint venture in China with a new partner, because we already have a partner, which is Donfan Group, where we sell and produce Citroën and Peugeot cars. <coughs> and in 2010, uh, when we decided to launch this new joint venture, we, we said, of course, we should not compete with the other one. Mm -hmm. So uh, we decided simply to only produce and sell the DS cars from Citroën. Personally, as I, I arrived in Shenzhen in, uh, in 2010 mm -hmm. with uh, five guys from PSA, five guys from uh, Chang'an Group, our partner, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. to uh, create a new company uh, and uh, to uh, create a factory. And uh, then uh, last year, we sold 26,000 cars and we have a factory. We have launched three new cars in 12 months and we have uh, almost 100 dealers in China. So just to make the story quick. So it uh, was a great adventure and something a uh, um, little bit uh, rare to, to experience uh, in the life of someone who is working in the automotive business, me and my colleagues. Mm -hmm. So then uh, uh, what maybe uh, is interesting to share is as well the fact that when we started, we knew that we had to sell and produce DS cars. But uh, finally, uh, when we started to work on it and when we... Uh, uh, where our first contact with potential investors, because we had to find people uh, to uh, invest in our dealership. We have seen very rapidly that uh, the maturity of the, of the premium car market in China uh, was of course there, everybody knows that, but now uh, we are in a second phase where we can find customers. They want something more than the traditional code of premium. And uh, the traditional code of premium in, in our industry, this is the German code, of course. This is BMW, Benz, Audi. Mm -hmm. So for DS, no chance to compete <laughs> in the same code that BMW, Benz, and Audi. And in the same time, the feedback from our target group uh, is that they are looking for something showing their independence, their test, uh, something more uh, close to technology, of course, and uh, aesthetism as well. Uh, those target group, we call them the modern business elite. They are young people, they work hard, they play hard, mm -hmm. they, you know them. Uh, I think you know them very well. But really, uh, they have this strong test. Mm -hmm. They are capable, uh, very interesting as well. We, we went with uh, Ipsos to visit uh, where those uh, customers uh, are living mm -hmm. and to take some pictures, you know, uh, inside their home and uh, opening uh, uh, the tiroir, uh, etc. And then uh, we discover many Hermes uh, goods. <laughs> and, uh, but the most interesting is that... Uh, you, but we, are, we have uh, the, more or less the same as well in Europe, but in China it's growing very fast. So you have uh, Hermes shoes, and uh, on the other side you have uh, some uh, totally destroyed uh, shoes, uh, tennis, mm -hmm. and when you talk to them, they explain to you that they don't want to, they want to keep those ones, they are using them every weekend. Mm -hmm. But they are using their Hermes shoes as well, uh, frequently. Mm -hmm. So 
so that this it was the first uh, uh, the, the first analysis about but the potential. But in a way, you can find that also in Paris. I mean, if you look at people's right. closets, you can yes. also find totally yeah. destroyed Absolutely. running shoes yes. and very chic polished Hermès. Absolutely. So yeah. you find the same. <laughs> you find the same in Paris. The maybe the difference is that in China, the size of the of the group is. Uh, is bigger. Is really bigger <laughs> yeah. and and is really uh, uh, increasing very fast. Okay, so so then uh, uh, when we started to do this, um, we developed our concept and very rapidly uh, we have seen that uh, what we were doing was creating a brand mm -hmm. because uh, we were creating dealer network, we were creating uh, specific cars. Then uh, we are creating a customer experience, mm -hmm. and then no reason not to go a uh, uh, little bit uh, above our ambition just to be a line of Citroën and to create a brand. What's the price range about of a DS? Goes from what to what? Uh, the the price range of DS is uh, is uh, in Europe around uh, thirty thousand to fifty thousand today, and uh, in China it's uh, around a little bit more than twenty thousand. Uh, it's not exactly the same, uh, the mm -hmm. same cars to uh, forty-five thousand. Interesting. The range are different. And um, um, sorry, I didn't mean yeah. to interrupt. No, so just you're because I, I, yeah, yeah, I just li like to share that uh, um, uh, what is interesting as well is to say that uh, uh, thirty years ago, uh, some uh, Japanese competitors they launched premium brands. You know them uh, like Infinity or Lexus. What is very interesting is that uh, uh, when they did that, they started by United States. Mm -hmm. 30 years after, uh, we decided to uh, launch our own premium brand for, for, for our group. And finally, we start in, in China. Uh, I think it's, 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 it's as well a symbol mm -hmm. of, uh, of course, where is the, the, the development. And the question mark, maybe we can talk about it, because everyone, everyone is, is pushing this question, who will lead? of course, the, the, the luxury market in the future. And we all have the question uh, in terms of test and, uh, and, 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 mm. and everything. Nevertheless, we know that the origin of the brand and the creation of the brand, of the brand remain the most important, in fact. Mm -hmm. Erwan thinks that it's the Chinese customer who's going to lead the Chinese yeah. market. But, uh, but in the same time, we, we made some, uh, some experience uh, uh, with our cars, mm -hmm. and finally, just to share with you, we have a car uh, totally uh, different from the rest of the market. The name is DS5, and uh, it's a car very unique, and uh, this car doesn't respect the code of the Chinese market. In what way? In the way that this car is, uh, is a little bit l between a, a big car and a coupe in the same time. Mm -hmm. So uh, it's quite big, but it's short as well. Mm -hmm. and. Uh, in the premium car market, it's important to have big cars. The more you are big, the more you are premium. This was the traditional code. But nevertheless, we decided to start with this car because this DS5 show exactly the DNA of what is DS brand today. This is a... a so this is a small car, right? Small. Well, it's small -ish, right? I will say middle <laughs> size compared to the rest of, of course, the market. Yes. Mm -hmm. But very, uh, very different in terms of shape. I don't have picture here, but... Uh, um, just to say that it was not respecting the code, but it's really innovative. So nevertheless, we started with this car because for us it was extremely important to show where we are coming from. And uh, in the future, we will develop a different range of cars and maybe we'll adapt more to the <coughs> market. But finally, the result is that we have sold this car much more than expected. Really? Yes. Wow, and then we developed a second one, more adapted to the Chinese market. We are satisfied of the sales, but it's not as high as expected. So there is a, as well something to learn because I think it's, it's for, for us, huh, it's going extremely fast, mm -hmm. uh, but in the same time, uh, um, we have to find the right way to adapt with keeping the DNA and the roots of our brands. Uh, I'm talking about luxury approach because mm -hmm. this is that the customer I b are buying. Isn't the change, or rather the pace of change in the Chinese market, <coughs> one perhaps of the biggest challenge for most brands and for you in particular? Yeah, probably the, the I, I've been living only four years in fact mm -hmm. in China. And you've so seen it change a lot in uh, four years? Of course in four years we see many changes. Mm. Uh, which is uh, nothing in terms of time when you think about Which it, is really. nothing in terms of time, but we, we can say that we see many changes uh, already in four years. 
And as well, uh, in, the, in our industry, uh, we design the cars for 2020 now. Mm -hmm. So that's the big challenge because uh, we... Uh, How are you it, sure that you're going to be uh, it appealing? Take four years. Yeah. Yes, it yeah. takes four years to, uh, to uh, create a yeah. car. It's but not uh, exactly like now. a shirt, you know, which yeah, yeah, takes exactly. a few minutes to yes, draw, maybe yes. six months to put on a shelf. A car is a bit different, yes, isn't it? Absolutely. And just maybe to, to, to finish on this... Um, uh, Hermès has uh, created uh, La Maison Hermès and, uh, uh, it's, and as you have explained, really to show the, the roots, uh, who you are, who, what is Hermès. And I like very much when you say that uh, you take your time and this is the big uh, strength of your brand, of course, especially in China. And uh, um, this is, is extremely respectful and this is something we have been learning as well. I think it's, uh, it's the first time that uh, we create something uh, uh, where uh, we have uh, the CEO of our company saying, for the S, we take time. So we don't speak about sales volume now. We are not mm -hmm. driven by sales volume anymore. And we take time to really create something strong. So we have been creating very rapidly in our approach as well our home in Shanghai. It's in Nanjing Lu. And the name is DS World. It's uh, smaller than La Maison Hermès, but we have done the same approach to have a place where you can stay and show that you are staying for a long time. Great. So, uh, like the rock, and uh, you in this place we do a contemporary art exhibition, we show cars, of course, but it's a place where you have time to discover the brand and uh, where we show that uh, we have a long time in front of us. Thank you, thank you. So I guess the, the nugget of wisdom of that, the pearl of wisdom, is that when things are changing very fast, you need to take your time. Mm -hmm. Um, now, I'd like to uh, uh, switch over to Christophe Kais, um, so who's the co-CEO of Albatros, which gathers and analyzes data about shoppers for brands. Am I describing this, this well? Um, and I think with you we're going to talk a lot about, because your business is really intelligence, gathering intelligence, consumer behavior, um, and... Um, you know, the brands commission the, your reports, right? And um, But maybe you can share with us a bit of the uh, winning tr strategies that uh, you've noticed for, for brands. Um, of course, there's only so much you can tell us without divulging uh, states, you know, important secrets, but it would be wonderful if you could tell us a bit about, uh, um, you know, what those strategies were and what really worked and what also didn't work in China would be interesting. Thank right. you. Thank you. Well, maybe perhaps uh, Astrid, before going there, I'd like to come back on what you were mentioning before and, and the speed of the development of, of the mm -hmm. Chinese market, basically. Um, the first time I went to Shanghai was in uh, 1991. And I remember being on the Bund mm -hmm. with um, a Chinese guide. And we were look looking across the river at Pudong, which at that time was totally empty. There was absolutely nothing. And this gentleman was telling us that within the next 10 years, that was going to be bigger than La Défense. And of course, it was very hard to believe. Um, and I came back to China where I spent uh, eight years in 2003, and I saw what it had become, and it was, it was really a shock. So indeed, uh, the, the changes are, are very fast, um, and they need to be taken into consideration. What we are, uh, and we were talking earlier with Erwan, Erwan what we are seeing today um, <clears throat> is a shift of Chinese consumer from Hong Kong to other destinations, but he, he will mm -hmm. elaborate on this. Um, and this is going extremely quickly. Mm -hmm. So um, to come back to your question, to talk about <laughs> strategies and challenges of the brand, what we see today in China is um, are a few things. The first one, of course, you don't look at the Chinese market as a unified market. You have different cities with different stages of development, um, what usually people call tier one, tier two, tier three cities, and so on. Um, now that, of course, is, is a bit challenging for brands because it's extremely difficult to actually have a strategy um, for one space, which, which is a mm -hmm. Chinese space, addressing those different stages of development. And we have seen clients, and I will not tell you which one, but who had a very specific image in tier one cities, which was the image they had in Paris, <coughs> London, or New York, and 
whose image in tier second tier and third tier cities mm -hmm. was very different. Was it a luxury brand? Yes, right. and it so was more than one luxury brand. So this is obviously mm -hmm. challenging. The other thing which needs to be taken into consideration is the speed at which those tier two and tier three cities are actually catching up. Mm -hmm. And when you're looking at a luxury consumer, um, a luxury, an affluent Chinese consumer living in Wuhan or Chongqing has the same exposure to luxury brand and to traveling abroad as somebody living in China, in Shanghai or mm -hmm, Beijing. Mm -hmm. So if you look at, again, this upper segment of the market, what is expected from those consumers is very different. But then when you look at the um, clients who, who are looking, who are more aspirational consumers, they, don't, they are not looking at the same thing. Perhaps mm -hmm. the consumers still in the tier three and tier four cities are looking at logo when everybody is saying, well, we need to get away from logo. Mm -hmm. Yes, this is true, but this is true mostly in Shanghai, Beijing, uh, Guangzhou. But this is not so true when you go into the tier three and tier four city. So it's a very complicated exercise today for the brand to have a strategy that takes into consideration those two... Um, those two so there's uh, a segmentation right, of right, demand right. with various levels of sophistication and expectations mm, right, of right. consumers. Yeah. Now, there was also a, an interesting finding from a study that was done by McKinsey a couple mm -hmm. of years ago, mm -hmm. saying that um, among the 75 most dynamic cities uh, that will be there in 2025, mm -hmm. 40 of them will be Chinese. And cities like Tianjin, for example, or Chongqing, will be in the third and twelfth place position, respectively, which is before places like, like London and Los Angeles. Yeah, no. So it is an amazing shift again, which is posing uh, considerable challenges. What, what do for they the mean by dynamic? Though? Dynamic is, is basically the influence. In terms of growth, uh, or in terms in of terms, in terms of growth, in terms of influence. Mm -hmm. I'm not talking in terms of size, obviously, because yeah, yeah. those mm -hmm. cities are by far and large bigger mm -hmm. than, than uh, in the Western world. But uh, in terms of um, yes, influence, I would say of those cities. Interesting. Yeah. Wow. And so, and how do you think um, that's going to evolve in the next few years? Do you think this segmentation is actually going to diminish? Do you think they're going to catch up and if we will have become more homogenized? Or do you I think I that there are just other cities who are also going to, you know, jump on the bandwagon and, and have different expectations as the urbanization of China continues, because that's also, you know, Ch China, I mean, it's the demographics, it's the social changes going on, I mean, it's all that. It's not only pe it's people, you know, uh, earning power growing, a larger middle class and upper middle class with changes that are changing, uh, tastes that are changing. So do you, how do you see that evolving? Well, I Again, I think there is clearly um, a situation where those second tier cities are catching up very mm -hmm. clearly. Mm -hmm. But what I believe is that it is increasingly dangerous for brands to talk about tiers. Mm -hmm. uh, I don't think it's relevant anymore. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and that needs to be completely reviewed. And, and the issue is that a lot of brands in their <coughs> research approach and methodology still go with tiers, mm -hmm. which again is not relevant. I think we need to look at consumer groups and not so much at tears anymore. So what would you suggest they do then? Would, they, would you suggest they have you know, products that meet everybody's uh, tastes and expectations, or you think they still have to have a geography-based uh, strategy? I mean, wh I what would you I suggest think it, they do? It all depends on what your objective is. Obviously, mm -hmm. uh, if you want to go for speed and volume today, let's not fool ourselves. The biggest part of the market is still the status seeker. Mm -hmm. okay. So the logo-driven... Lo right. Logo-driven people. Which Very is a bit of a false debate, though, the whole... I, I agree with you. I agree with you, but yeah. this is still people who are buying luxury product mm -hmm. to say something to their friends. Mm -hmm. A status uh, symbol, right. status symbol, mm -hmm. absolutely. And, and of course, the aspirational client uh, is here, is on the rise, mm -hmm. uh, is probably the future of, of China, but this is not what's driving the business today and the volume. So you need to know as a brand what you want to do. A brand like Hermes very clearly is not interested in going after the status seeker. They mm -hmm. are going after the aspirational clients. And I think most luxury brands should be well off following this type of strategy mm -hmm. very clearly, mm -hmm. uh, which is more long term, which is maybe not the most um, uh, revenue dri driven mm -hmm. one, but mm -hmm. uh, this mm -hmm. is the one that should be looked at. Now, there Very is a, interesting. A, another dimension that brands, I believe, need to uh, 
to take into consideration a bit more is also um, which is a regional sensibility. Mm -hmm. And what we've seen is a, in a lot of study we've done is that um, northern China behaves very very differently than South China. And I'll give you one concrete example. We did a number of um, focus group discussion for luxury brands. And one of them was for a famous Italian brand um, who had done an advertising in the Forbidden City. Okay. That was taken really well in Shanghai. There was no problem, no issue. Shanghainese were happy with it. But when we showed this advertising to our group in Beijing, the reaction was not very enthusiastic. Uh, we had the same question about the Fendi catwalk. Was it Gucci? No. No, which one? Can you tell us? I mean, <laughs> no, but probably you, you got three choices. <laughs> no, no it was, but probably it was, it's been written. No, it, it's about been done. Yeah. So it was Zenia. Zenia. Um, there was also the Fendi catwalk on mm -hmm. the Great Wall, which was fantastic in the view of people from Guangzhou and Shanghai. But when we asked to the people from Beijing, did you mm -hmm. think it was relevant to them to do something on an historical site? Mm -hmm. Sacrilegious. Right? It was. It was absolutely not well perceived. Mm -hmm. So those are the type of. Insight, I believe, that brands need to take into mm -hmm. consideration as well. Like the Louis Vuitton uh, mall on Red Square, which was not Correct. exactly, uh, Correct. didn't go Correct. down Maybe too well. Maybe it was not the right time either. Yeah, oh. interesting. Um, thank you so much for all this insight. I think people might want to comment or rebound on, on your comments. Uh, now I'd like to um, ask a few questions to Monsieur Panconesi, who's the uh, uh, CEO and founder of the online fashion retailer Luisa Viaroma. Um, and you have quite an interesting experience because when we were talking on the phone, you told me that what your customers in China expected was authenticity. Um, because for them, you know, ordering something from Florence, which is where you're based the whole, uh, is a guarantee that I'm going to get the real thing. In fact, uh, after I spoke to you, I did a bit of research and then I found this article saying that... Uh, a significant amount, I think it was like 20% or something, of online shipped goods are actually fakes. Um, and that's a huge problem for people developing online businesses is how do people uh, make sure that they're going to get the real thing, you know. Um, I mean, online shopping has a lot of advantages, but also disadvantages because you can't actually touch the product and, you know, sense the quality before it gets to your front door. Um, so, how, how do you deal with that problem? Well, you know, uh, sometimes it's even difficult to uh, recognize a real one from the fake, even if you touch it, because uh, mm -hmm. the fakes are so well done. But it's a totally different experience. You know, our clients, they don't want to get anything to do with, sorry for this, Uh, it's a different experience. So uh, the only guarantee really is uh, to uh, buy from uh, a proper vendor. Mm -hmm. you know, that's the only, that's really So you're the, the kind way. of guarantee because of your reputation as a vendor? Yes, right? of course, a reputation, mm -hmm. that's what counts, you know. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Uh, that's, that's the number one thing, you know, and it is a very big issue. Nowadays, it's so easy, you know, to because online, as you say, uh, I would say more than 20% are fake. Really? And yes. What is your estimate? I, I, you cannot make an estimation, mm. but uh, you know the big brands, uh, they have big problems in uh, fighting uh, mm -hmm. the fakes, and it's a very difficult battle. So for the clients, the only real uh, way to, um, uh, to make sure that they're getting the real thing is mm -hmm. to buy from a proper vendor. Mm -hmm. That's the only way. And, and the big threat, I think, for this whole industry is when Amazon and eBay are really going to crack that market, which they are trying to do, as you well know. And that will be another issue of controlling the quality of the uh, products that are being shipped through them. Uh, yeah. Well, luckily, we are not a producer. We are a distributor, so mm -hmm. um, this is not uh, our primary problem. Mm -hmm. You know, our primary problem is to make sure that our clients know that we represent and distribute mm -hmm. the best brands and uh, they are all original. And that's mm -hmm. one of the reasons why I will, uh, I'm, not, uh, I'm not willing to open a, a, a warehouse mm -hmm. in, in China. Mm -hmm. because Even though it's your second market after the US, right? That's correct? Yes, mm -hmm. yes. Well, mm -hmm. it, was, it was very small 
two, three years ago. It mm -hmm. just grew incredibly, no? Actually, in 11-11, uh, 11, 11, 11 of, uh, of, of November, which is a single day, mm -hmm. and uh, during the uh, new Chinese year, uh, the access and the turnover was uh, more than US, which has always been our primary market ever since, even before we started the e-commerce, because Luisa actually, I just, for you to know, uh, was my grandmother, and uh, she was a French lady, and she was a millinery, a hat designer here in Paris. I'm not going to make the whole story, but, uh, but uh, she met my grandfather who was doing a straw. He was doing a straw, f very famous uh, product of Florence. And they started to do straw hats here in Paris. And then for different reason, they moved back to, to Florence where uh, they opened a, a small shop and they became bigger. And it's still there after three generations. So, but really the thing that changed... Well, what are they called? The huh? What is the brand called? I don't know. The brand, which brand? The hats. The, are, they, do you still, are there hats still being produced? It was called Louisa. Oh, it was Louisa. It was right. at the end of 18th century here in, in Paris. La Porte Saint-Martin, she had a small shop and she was uh, displaying her hats at l'Arc de Triomphe where my grandfather was going to bet, was uh, a passionate of horses. He was there betting on the horses and she was displaying her hats. That's are are you met. selling them on the internet, or it's completely? Excuse me. Are you selling the Luisa hats on your website? No, no, no. We, are, we don't produce. We don't produce hats. You know, we don't produce hats. We are just distributing. We don't produce anything, and we don't have any private label. Luckily, we are just. Uh, this is just know. the history of retail that you have in your family, and which has evolved into the online world. Now. Well, well, my life changed as mm. well as my business when mm -hmm. I decided to to stay in Florence and not go around buying. Mm -hmm. as I used to do for the past 40 years, you know, because uh, the work of a retailer is buying mm -hmm. and selling, of mm -hmm. course, you know. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. I was eight months a year around the world um, researching new uh, collections. Mm -hmm. I wanted to stay home because I had my small children. I didn't want to leave them. So I decided to take care of uh, this new idea was the web, the mm -hmm. e-commerce. It started in 1999 and it was you know, something unknown then. If you think about it, uh, at that time, um, Google was in his, uh, in his uh, uh, beta uh, stage. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Facebook uh, only arrived in year 2004. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So it was something, uh, I didn't know anything about it. Uh, we started uh, hiring uh, engineers from the university to explain them how Fashion is different uh, from mm -hmm. automobile or from, uh, you know, selling uh, other items. You know, fashion has size, has colors. So it was quite difficult. It's interesting. But uh, it's challenging, challenging. Now it's 95% of my business. Yeah. And China is a huge the market. market that is growing the fastest. How, m how long does it take uh, for somebody, uh, I guess, in Shanghai and then maybe a smaller city to get something if they order it from you? Well, right now it will, it will take four or five days mm -hmm. because we cannot Which manage... Which is still very little if you think about it. <laughs> no, well, it's a long time. <laughs> uh, we know we have difficulties in doing uh, all the shipping uh, following the all the buyer, all mm -hmm. the buying, you know, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. because uh, we do everything ourselves, including the logistic. Mm -hmm. But uh, ne uh, at the end of March, we will move to a much larger uh, warehouse. So mm -hmm. hopefully, we will go back to our standard, which is two maximum three days for the whole <coughs> China. You saw the valuation for far fetched. Uh, uh, yeah. The online retailer, yes, a billion, yes. which is quite yes, remarkable. But I'm not interested. You're, it's not giving you ideas? No, not at all. <laughs> <laughs> not a faintest idea, really. You know, I have too much fun. And no. it's... Uh, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, really, I really love my job. And of course, at the end of the year, uh, we look at how much we make. And it's mm -hmm. plenty, much more that I can spend. So it's totally 100% uh, private company. And uh, I hope it will be also for the next generation. Mm -hmm. uh, so in spite of the competition, because uh, the internet has become 
hugely cutthroat yes, competitive. Yes, but you know, the people that they ask me, shall I open, uh, mm -hmm. especially young people that mm -hmm. are just in business, shall I open uh, my e-commerce? I tell them, you know, the e-commerce is just the last... Uh, Last, chain? Piece, last yeah. piece of the chain, mm -hmm, you know? mm -hmm. because you need to have uh, a strategy, you need to have a business working already, mm -hmm. then you can put it online, mm -hmm. because otherwise you lose your money, because nowadays you can make an e-commerce very easily, you know, it's, mm -hmm. a, uh, it's not a... Yeah, a the web, barriers web, to entry are very low, yeah. It's not, it's not a problem, but it's a strategy and the, and, and, and the, and, and the, um, the strategy that makes the difference, you mm -hmm, know. Mm -hmm. we, we, we were able to do it and to develop it uh, slowly in the last 15 years, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. but because I have uh, been in this business by the past 40 years before, and, uh, you know, it's uh, three generation developing of the same concept. You know, right, so so yeah. that's what makes the difference. But, um, you know, I, I don't want to go in all the differences we have with other um, com competition, mm -hmm, competitors. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. I just want to mention the fact that from a small little boutique in, uh, in one street, from one window in Via Roma, Via Roma is a street of Florence where we are located, the only one store, uh, we, we, we became a window in the world. Mm. And Which uh, is the magic of the internet, isn't it? Yes, thanks, yeah. to, the, thanks to the web, mm. thanks to the web. Great. And uh, our competitors now, are the biggest competitor are the U.S. competitors. Mm -hmm. They are Neiman Marcus, Nordstrom, Saks, which are which they have woken two, up to the internet yes. mm -hmm. times bigger than us mm -hmm. in in real life, mm -hmm. but they are only two or three times bigger in on on on, on the web. Mm -hmm. You know, mm -hmm. maybe mm -hmm. five times bigger, not more. You know, so that's incredible. And you have net apporté and, and yes, then yes, then yes. We are, we are not no more than ten competitors, mm -hmm. ten, twelve mm -hmm. competitors in the world that they deal with top designers mm -hmm. you know of course there are many <coughs> who are doing uh, <coughs> who are doing uh, mass production or mass uh, volumes can you tell us what are the brands that you sell the most well of course the they're like top three brands the brands that we sell the most are uh, the big brands that they are uh, international uh, recognition you know because the first like, time like the ones? client buy from us they mm -hmm. buy from a big brand because mm -hmm. they want to test the test, uh, they want to test the service, the, the, the shipping, the mm -hmm. delivery, and everything. Mm -hmm. uh, afterwards, is it mine? I think, yeah, it's okay. I don't believe it. <laughs> I don't know how to stop it's it. A popular guy. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Uh, so the big, the big brand are the, are the Italian or French brands, you know, they are... Uh, uh, Givenchy, Balmain, uh, Saint Laurent, Dolce Gabbana. Mm -hmm. These are the big brands that they Valentino. are. Valentino. Valentino, of course. They are unfortunately not Hermes mm -hmm. because they don't uh, distribute through <laughs> only, only through their own uh, stores. <laughs> not planning <laughs> no, 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 no. Okay, everybody, great. Well, everybody has their own strategy. Time's running out, um, and, I and there are a lot. There are still two people here who haven't uh, shared their wisdom and experience in China, mm -hmm. and I'd like to um, give the microphone to Erwan Rambourg, so who's the uh, author of the Bling Dynasty, and I would like to ask him about um, how. Uh, the Chinese demand for luxury brands uh, has evolved in recent years. Uh, the other thing I forgot to mention is that Erwan is also global co-head of consumer and retail research at HSBC. That's his real job, but um, <laughs> uh, which makes him also uh, a very big authority and expert uh, on the subject. Thank you. Um, so I think to, to the question of change and what has fundamentally changed over the past few years, I think a few speakers uh, mentioned uh, speed, um, the speed of evolution and the greater sophistication of uh, Chinese <coughs> luxury consumption. And I think that's linked to the fact that uh, many Chinese consumers are significantly younger um, than their European peers or their American peers. And so obviously they're a lot more plugged in. Uh, they're all over blogs and forums. Uh, there's a lot of uh, word of mouth, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and so I think the, the implication, uh, probably the biggest recent change, in my view, uh, beyond uh, digital, beyond um, blogs, forums, and, and chats, et cetera, has been outbound travel, uh, which, in my view, 
has been uh, probably the biggest uh, change in terms of uh, a greater knowledge building, a greater understanding of what the brands are about, uh, a greater understanding of what you should be paying for the brand. Uh, so if you think about price harmonization, that's probably uh, a quasi-obligation now for many of the luxury companies uh, because many people talk about China uh, when the reality is you should be talking about the Chinese. I mean, I'm, I happen to be based in Hong Kong. Uh, my job, my real uh, life job, as you said, <laughs> is to uh, advise investors and, and tell them about what the big thematics are and how to invest mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Uh, in companies. And many, many people call me up just because I'm based in Hong Kong and tell me, you know, they ask me what's going on in China. And so I'm very polite and I try to uh, <laughs> tell them what I think is going on in China. But the reality is I try to skew the conversation away to tell them what's going on with the Chinese because that's mm -hmm. really uh, what's important for most of the luxury subsectors. Obviously, automobiles is slightly different because you're not going to uh, mm -hmm. import uh, an automobile from, um, from abroad. But in my view, 75, 80% of consumption uh, from uh, Chinese nationals takes place outside of mainland China. 50 to 75%? S 75 to 80% uh, really? of sales. Really? Um, Interesting. Now, mainland China. Okay. Yeah, uh, so that uh, outside of mainland China. So you China mean they buy include... more in Milan and New York? And... So, so that's the other thing uh, related to speed. Uh, the destinations are changing. Um, and they're changing linked to currency. So for example, the, the collapse in the euro recently, the collapse in the yen has had a lot more Chinese people go to Tokyo, come here mm -hmm. to continental Europe. Mm -hmm. uh, you've had um, obviously political uh, events, uh, the events in Thailand, for example, um, You've had uh, Malaysian Airlines incidents, you know, from uh, one day to the next, Southeast Asia pretty much disappeared from the map, and that can change uh, quickly. You've had events in mm -hmm. Hong Kong. Uh, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. You know, I don't really have uh, a long-term social political view. That's not my job. Uh, but obviously, what happened in Hong Kong has not helped beyond the fact that the retail uh, environment has become more and more dull. Uh, you know, if you think about wealthy Chinese individuals uh, coming to Hong Kong, it's a bit boring now. Uh, because many of the retail operators have probably not been uh, focusing on the right things. They've been focusing on rents rather than being uh, focused on added value to the consumers. Uh, and so wealthy Chinese individuals mm. have found many alternatives in the region, whether it's Tokyo, uh, whether it's Seoul because anything Korean is cool, um, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. whether it's Taipei if you want to renew with your roots, go to the National Museum, uh, see what used to be uh, in the Forbidden City up mm -hmm. until 1949 mm -hmm. when they took mm -hmm. everything away and put it in Taipei. Um, so that's another uh, element of pressure for brand managers, which is the speed at which uh, Chinese uh, nationals are arbitraging between the different destinations. Mm. Yeah, they're um, very so efficient, again, very Europe, quick. Yeah. Euro mm. Europe was in trouble six, nine months ago. Um, and then suddenly with the collapse in the euro, uh, you're starting to see mm. uh, purchases massively mm. uh, uh, you know, increasing here. Again, mm. Korea uh, up and coming, um, Tokyo up and coming, uh, Australia is starting to be on the map mm. as well. Singapore. Uh, S Singapore has been a bit more difficult because Singapore has been part of the sort of um, tour operator mm -hmm. um, uh, hub with Malaysia, Thailand and Singapore uh, in the same trip. So obviously with the issues in Thailand, and the issues with the perception mm -hmm. that I can't go to Malaysia right. uh, because it's dangerous. Um, that's been affected. Plus the gaming as well. Mm -hmm. you know, there's gaming in Singapore. If you look at what's taking place in Macau, mm -hmm. um, there's a sort of uh, lighter version of that taking place in Singapore. So Singapore has not been uh, that easy of late. In, in your book, it's quite interesting. You talk about also the, the rising competition from other new luxury brands that are not necessarily European. Could you tell us a bit about those? and? and how you see them conquering uh, traditional Chinese customers that, for example, Hermès uh, takes for granted and maybe uh, thinks that you know, might be challenged by uh, these new uh, Asian brands? So, so there are up-and-coming uh, alternatives to the traditional European brands. I wouldn't necessarily look at Hermès as being the, the biggest victim because uh, I guess it depends mm, on your definition you're, you're of luxury. Right. You're right. Um, yeah. if, if you define luxury like I suspect you understand mm -hmm. defines luxury, uh, he would probably not consider that the brands uh, I'm about to mention are uh, alternatives. Mm -hmm. uh, but it's true that with greater travel, with greater knowledge, uh, there has been uh, recently uh, the emergence of a lot of alternative uh, propositions, whether it's in leather goods and accessories, mm -hmm. you know, value for money, um, uh, alternative lifestyle brands from the US, people like Michael Kors or Tory Burch. Uh, you've had the emergence of Korean grown um, leather goods brand, so MCM, which is technically mm -hmm. a German brand, but bought by Korean assets about 15 years ago. 
appearing to the Chinese as being a, a legitimate Korean brand. Mm -hmm. um, obviously, anything Korean, as I said, is cool with the uh, development of Hallyu, you know, the Korean wave, which is a phenomenon started 15 years ago around K-pop music, uh, soap mm -hmm. operas. Um, it's not a fad because it's been going on for 15 years, but the new element is that for the past two years, you've had a lot of uh, brand ambassadors being used, you've had a lot of product placements. So they've been quite smart and aggressive in yeah. promoting uh, these brands. Yeah, There's I mean also Louis XIV, no? Like yeah. the, uh, <laughs> amazing name. So I, I actually interviewed the CEO of Louis XIV uh -huh. mid-December. Well, who owns it? Um, it's, it's privately owned. Um, and but it's, is it Korean? It is Korean, yeah, it is Korean. Louis XIV, yeah, Louis um, and, Korean and, brand. And I asked him, you know, what, <laughs> be, be, being French, obviously. Handbags, you should, so they, you, they sell them in Paris, and they, I, I found advertising in Elle and Vogue the other days. When you interview... They should join the Comité Colbert. <laughs> <laughs> so, so I interviewed the CEO mid-December, asked him, you know, what's the principle? I'm French, so obviously I found it hilarious. Um, <laughs> and he tells me, basically, it's the same quality as Louis Vuitton, half the price. It, it is half the price. I, uh -huh. I don't judge quality, but... <laughs> but, but, but the reason Slippery I'm saying slope. the reason I'm saying these are competitors is mm -hmm. they're actually pinching staff from the traditional European mm -hmm. um, manufacturers. Mm -hmm. They're actually competing for space. You know, mm -hmm. if you're thinking about a shopping mall, if you're thinking about uh, department store allocation, if you're thinking about your tenants, mm -hmm. you want MCM. You don't want the smaller alternative leather goods brands. That's why I'm saying Hermes is not uh, mm -hmm. in the camp, or you know Vuitton mm -hmm. or, or Prada mm -hmm. or Gucci. But mm -hmm. if you're looking at alternative, smaller Italian, French origin brands, actually that's not what the tenants in Asia will want. They'll mm. want uh, faster turn uh, Korean origin brands right now. Interesting. And um, when you look at the evolution of the Chinese customer, how do you see it evolving in the future? Um, well, I think there's still a fascination for uh, what's going on abroad. Um, mm -hmm. And so my view is Chinese, for uh, the time being, are wanting to relate to the New Yorker, to the Parisian, to the person in Milan, Tokyo, uh, Seoul, etc. Mm -hmm. um, and so I think uh, an example like <laughs> Shangxia is very fascinating because for me, Shangxia will probably be a big success in the long term. But I think it's going to take quite a while to build it out because there's always this sort of by default hurdle uh, in the minds of many Chinese consumers that if it's made by a Chinese corporate, I'm not, uh, mm -hmm. um, you know, I'm not 100% comfortable. Uh, plus, added to that, you have the sort of uh, uh, pressure cooker theory, mm -hmm. which is this idea that the Chinese were basically locked in uh, in the country because regulation for outbound travel had been very uh, constraining, and suddenly they're allowed to travel. And so, since when have the have they been more free to travel, the Chinese? Well, it, it, it depends on regulation, market by market. But I, I would say the tipping point was probably SARS, probably 2003, mm -hmm. uh, where you had the issues hitting Hong Kong, and basically the Chinese administration uh, putting in new uh, visitation schemes uh, to enable Chinese nationals to go to Hong Kong. And then, obviously, to go more to Taipei with the installation of quotas. Mm -hmm. And then, market by market, the Korean, the Australian, the British, the American uh, mm -hmm. administration, making it a lot easier in terms of visa, um, you know, obtaining visas. Um, if you look at the latest regulation in Japan from January mm -hmm. this year, the latest mm -hmm. uh, regulation from the Obama administration in November 14, mm -hmm. everyone's mm -hmm. making it easier for Chinese people to come around because people are pragmatic, they want to mm -hmm. do business. Mm -hmm. um, it's a battle for the Chinese tourists out there. Yeah, yeah it is. Yeah, I mean, it's, uh, it's clearly, I mean, if you look at figures, December 14, January 15, uh, year on year, you've had 66% more visas, Chinese visas for the US. It doesn't mean you have 66% more people, mm -hmm. but theoretically you could. Um, so yes, it, it is... Uh, a big competition, and if you look at outbound travel, it's about 100 million people, a bit more, 108 last year. That's quite a big country. S well, the, the thing it's is, 60% of those people were going to Hong Kong and Macau, so the rest of the world is untapped. I mean, I, I joke with former colleagues, I used to work at LVMH in Richemont, I joke with former colleagues who keep on telling me, oh, the queues of Chinese people in Paris, Milan, yeah. etc., it's mm -hmm. incredible. They better get used to it. It's just starting. Great. Wow. Thank you. Anyway, highly recommend Bling Dynasty if you want to hear more about it. Uh, now, um, I'd like to uh, speak now with David Daves Vasena, who's the Vice President of Product and Marketing at Vertu. Um, and uh, I think you also have quite a, a, a different view uh, of uh, how, you know, the Chinese uh, customer has evolved because, I mean, they are quite connected people, right? right? So, you know, Vertu is the luxury mobile phone brand. Um, how, how have you uh, 
Wood seduced the Chinese customer, and could you tell us a bit about your experience there? Sure. Thanks. So first of all, good morning, everyone. Um, so China is is very important for Vertu. Um, China has been the first market outside of Europe where Vertu opened the store back in 2003 uh, in Shanghai, and uh, today is our most important market. And then, if you consider not China but Chinese, right? Mm -hmm. uh, I.e., those you know, uh, China consumers actually purchase abroad, it is even more important mm -hmm. for us, right? Mm -hmm. And a significant portion of our sales in Europe and uh, greater China and the US are actually driven by Chinese travelers. Interesting. So, very important for us. <coughs> so, um, and we have been, therefore, in a uh, very privileged uh, position to observe the changes that the Chinese consumer, especially in the luxury world, has gone through in the last 10 years, and even more accelerated in the last, uh, I would say, two to four years, right? Um, and, uh, well, at Virtu, we've gone through a lot of changes in the last uh, two years, uh, where uh, we have been, you know, striving to put back the consumer at the heart of what we do. And uh, due to what I just said, uh, Chinese consumers are really the heart of the heart, right? Are really uh, mm -hmm. the most important part of our customer base uh, so for us. So what percentage of your revenues at. depend on the Chinese consumer? Well, I cannot disclose that, but it's a significant portion, right? right? Um, uh, so what I would like to give you is a couple of examples of how Virtu has evolved and changed in the last couple of years, mirroring and adapting to the changes that in particular the Chinese consumers have gone through, right? As a testimony of mm -hmm. what, uh, what it means for a luxury brand to actually uh, um, acknowledge the changes that are going on in the market and actually do something about it, right? I'll give you a couple of nuggets. The first one is about our products and uh, our product portfolio. So you might know or you might not know, the Virtu is, um, is in, a, in the crossroad between uh, luxury and technology. Would do you have you a Virtu phone on you? Yes, of course I do. Well, I think you, need, you need to show us. <laughs> so this is a Virtu phone. Can I see? Sure. <laughs> um, No, exactly, but this is one of the things I wanted to it's say. It's got a leather right? finish. Very nice. So this is Calf, and oh. uh, it runs Android. This is what, Tori Yonka? Uh, <laughs> uh, well, it's, it's French Calf, and we actually share a few suppliers. Um, so, uh, on the product side, I, I, as I was saying, Virtu does luxury mobile phones. So, we actually leave both the luxury angle and the technology angle, which is a very mm -hmm. funny place to be. And uh, um, what we have been going through in the last couple of years from a product perspective is on one side to revisit completely our approach to uh, design and the usage of materials, right? Especially for a brand that, as uh, uh, th someone, uh, thank you, uh, you know, just reminded us, has kind of somewhat a, uh, a, an history of being associated to showy products, mm -hmm. right? Yeah, I remember so the Vertu, I think uh, it was at Basel you were, no, you, or at the SESH? We used to be at Basel, yes. At Basel, right? Yes. I remember I went there yes. and there were objects of like jewelry. Um, yes. yes. Can you tell us how much a Vertu phone costs around and from what to what, like the price range? So today our enterprise is 4,900 euros. Ha sorry? 4,900 euros. <laughs> Excuse me? Ooh. And then... Uh, I could well, get a Hermes bag for that, no? <laughs> no, not even. And then... <laughs> And then the sky is the limit, right? It can, it can be expensive. But what we have been doing from a portfolio perspective has been to actually move away from this image of, uh, you know, uh, precious materials and stones, mm -hmm. etc., and towards a much more understated and uh, classy way of looking at or interpreting what a luxury mobile mm -hmm. phone might be. So h what materials have changed? Because before it was kind of, uh, you know, very kind of bling. I remember the phones right. from, say, five, seven years ago. Right. So, well, we use a lot, a lot more refined materials. We use a lot of leather, mm -hmm. right? We don't use any more um, uh, uh, gold or precious, precious mm -hmm. uh, materials, except for, you know, our really, really top mm -hmm. of the range. But Do it's you not get special anything. orders as well? 
We also do made to order, yeah. right? Mm -hmm. And uh, yes, you know, there are still customers that ask strange things. Like yes. what? Well, you know, very luxury, you know, phones in, in very luxury materials, right? You can't give but, us but an example? Like all, all diamonds? Well, uh, gold and diamonds, right? Mm -hmm. But this is w the, the real difference is that those phones used to be part of our core portfolio in mm, the past. Interesting. They're not mm. anymore, right? So the vast majority of our volumes and all our communication is focused on a very different way of interpreting mm. what a luxury mobile phone is. And of course, we still have customers that, as you were, as you were saying, right, come from a different background and mm. still you know, have in mind this showy uh, you know, consumption of business. But this is not any way, a, anymore what we stand for, right? And the other side of you know, our product view is, is technology. So, uh, Virtu today is um, comparable with uh, an iPhone, uh, an iPhone 6, or uh, the latest... Uh, in terms uh, of what? In, in terms of features and technology. Right, we run Android, and uh, uh, the uh, specifications that our products have are actually better and higher mm. than what an iPhone is. So is tell us about the cool things that a Virtu phone does. Well, you know, we, we do not differentiate on technology, right? Mm -hmm. We don't have the size and the scale to compete mm -hmm. in R&D with the big guys, mm -hmm. right? So technology is not and will not be in the future our point of differentiation. Mm -hmm. But we have reached parity, right? Mm -hmm. What we stand for, what we differentiate for, is the whole notion of being a luxury phone, right? Mm -hmm. And as, you know, a Hermes So it's in the design and the look, and, and basically you've become more you say elegant as opposed to bling, maybe if you, is that more, more like your image? Is that of one of elegance and, know, and, you know, and luxury, sophistication? Luxury is not, about, uh, is not about functionality, right? Mm -hmm. uh, you don't buy a, a, a Nermis bag because it carries weight uh, you know, more efficiently than mm -hmm. uh, you know, a 100 euros bag. You, 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 you buy a Hermes bag because it is a MS. Right? Mm -hmm. So it is not about functionality. The challenge we have as a brand, of course, is that mobile phones are a functional category. Right? So uh, we are uh, you know, uh, in, the, you know, in, in the process of uh, establishing a category, mm -hmm. being in fact the only player in this category so far, mm -hmm. right? uh, which is a challenge per se. Um, and uh, uh, yes, I think we've been very successful so far in terms of uh, uh, planting the seed mm -hmm. of the fact that mobile phones can, so you, you can differentiate in uh, one of your more personal mm -hmm. belongings as the mobile phone is uh, from uh, the, you know, the mainstream as mm -hmm. you do when you buy a bag, as you do when you buy a car, as you do when you buy a vacation mm -hmm. or a bottle of wine, right? So why not a mobile phone? So uh, the, the, the going back to China, mm -hmm, right? Mm -hmm. So the evolution that the Chinese consumer, that we have witnessed in the, in the Chinese mm -hmm. consumers in the last few years, actually determine an acceleration in this process in Virtu, of evolving from uh, what Virtu used to be in the past to what Virtu is today. Definitely from a product perspective, which is the first angle I wanted to, to give mm -hmm, you. Mm -hmm. the, uh, the second angle I would like to give you is, is the brand itself. Right, so uh, Virtu handmade, uh, Virtu, Virtu phones are handmade in England by a single craftsman, mm -hmm, right? Mm -hmm. That assembles the phones in Church Crookham in Hampshire. In, in where? In Church Crookham in Hampshire, mm -hmm. where our factory and global headquarters are. Um, and, and the phones are actually signed off by the craftsman that, uh, that made them. This is a very powerful story, right? That uh, especially for Chinese consumer, and uh, uh, the Hermes colleague was, was actually uh, mentioning about uh, heritage and craftsmanship, craftsmanship as mm -hmm. very important messages for, for the Chinese consumer, increasingly important. And this has now been uh, uh, added to the, as a lockup to our brand, as one of the changes that we made in the last couple of years. Now Virtu is not anymore just Virtu, it's Virtu handmade in England. And this is actually a, uh, also an action that mm. we took in response to what we have been seeing as an evolution, especially in the Chinese market. Oh, that's great. And then the third example I would mm -hmm. like to give in terms of uh, um, uh, the way we have been reacting to the evolution in the Chinese landscape is we have embraced digital, mm -hmm. right? 
Uh, you mean online retailing? Or? Yes, you, mm -hmm. you probably know that less than 20% of the luxury brands have uh, transactional uh, uh, e-commerce in China. We are one of them. We launched it mm -hmm. in, uh, in December mm -hmm, mm -hmm. last year, so it's very new, right? But it is, it is uh, one of the things that we have identified as the key for a long-term success in China because, uh, well, as uh, we heard already today, uh, that is the, the, mm -hmm. the go-to market strategy is mm -hmm. definitely um, one of the things that we have been urged to adapt. So one of the biggest right. battlefields in China is going to be Absolutely. online, right? Absolutely. Oh, Absolutely. That's great. Um, I think time is running up and I'd like to um, uh, open the floor to a few questions, if I may. Uh, uh, I think we have the microphone right here. Uh, for any of the panelists, does anybody would like to um, ask a question or, or share with us some remarks? We don't have much time. We have about a few minutes. Uh, but uh Thank you. My name is Jean-Noël Capferrer. I have a question for the panel and especially uh, the gentleman from Hermes. Uh, what are the limits of answering China's demand when you look at the volume it, it represents? The, will uh, Hermes follow up is a scarcity policy, which means not answering the demand? Um, that's obviously uh, uh, um, an interesting question. Um, today, to give a f rough figure, uh, Chinese customers represent approximately 30% of our sales, um, uh, including, as it has been said before, uh, mainland China, Hong Kong, and at, at wow. Macau, and also the Chinese traveling abroad. Uh, this scarcity uh, of Hermes products, mostly leather products, um, is a reality that it's hard to say that and, and to convince people, but we don't organize it. It's the result of the, um, uh, of the, of the fact that this, these products, these bags, are handmade and, and uh, signed also uh, by each uh, craftsman or craftsperson. Um, and, um, and that we are hiring constantly new people, training them, creating new um, uh, sites, new factories in France. We, have going, we are going to inaugurate two of them uh, next June, and we are working on two more. Um, but you have to know that uh, it takes up to 18 months to train internally the, the, the people to be really... Uh, uh, able to, ma to make uh, a perfect uh, leather bag. So the rhythm uh, of growth um, is really, we, 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 we couldn't do, go faster uh, physically because um, uh, we can't decide to hire uh, 2,000 people. That means that we need to have uh, 500 or 600 of our own people in training. And then it's, uh, it's, uh, it's impossible to, to face. So we are growing around 10% in volume, uh, volume-wise, 10% per year, which is a really a, a big effort. Then it's true that the Chinese customers have this, this feeling of um, a challenge to obtain an Hermes bag. And, uh, of course, we have... Uh, people traveling abroad, bu buying abroad. Uh, we have uh, some problems of parallel uh, market in, in China. It's, uh, uh, or in Hong Kong, uh, there are some, some stores offering the, our products, which are not fakes, which are real products, both, uh, both uh, in Europe or where else. Um, and um, so it's, 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 a, it's a situation we are confronted with. But we are not going to change our strategy or to change the fact that above uh, every, um, I mean, the top priority as Herme at Hermes, above everything else, is to maintain the quality. And so we, won't n we will never do anything uh, against that. Yeah, I, I just had a comment on the question. I, I think you're pointing to the, the paradox of luxury, which is basically brands trying to sell more what's supposed to be exclusive. And, and how do you address that paradox? And most brands 
in the soft luxury space will address that paradox by trying to develop the illusion of scarcity. I think the, the chance of Hermès is it's not an illusion. There's a reality of scarcity and, um, you know, trying to, um, again, support this illusion of scarcity if you're Vuitton or Gucci or, you know, if you're producing four million units a year, it's only going to be an illusion. Uh, and there's no issue in terms of actually accessing leather uh, or being able to produce more. Uh, but there are ways around it. There are ways to give this illusion of scarcity around uh, developing different window displays, uh, making sure that you're out of stock on, on you know, niche launches of products, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, for Hermès, it's, it's a reality of scarcity. Um, there is another uh, part of the, uh, the luxury uh, industry where sometimes you have real scarcity, which is high-end watches. Obviously, it's not the case right now, uh, given the issues uh, in Hong Kong, but you will have cycles. Uh, the big difference with watches is you're very much driven by uh, a wholesale-driven business, which is not the case for Hermes. Um, but in watches, cycle after cycle, you'll get into issues of, I can't produce enough uh, watches uh, if the demand is too big. I think Patek Philippe, I mean, uh, you know, a few brands have issues of also uh, supplies uh, in terms of meeting demand for certain models. Um, uh, it's interesting, I remember this uh, uh, front cover of The Economist who did a special report on luxury and it said, exclusive for everybody. It kind of <laughs> captured the spirit. Would, uh, yes, please, go ahead. I've got a question here and then one there. Um, Eric Pestel is from Lucadoc. It's a question for I1. Um, I would like to know what is your opinion about the future of uh, Hong Kong and Macau as a hub of luxury? Do you think that they, they will go on or they will lose their place or ranking with Tokyo or other places? Um, I think Hong Kong has structural issues. Um, I shouldn't be saying this because I live there um, and I work at HSBC, but um, I think Hong Kong, and, and again, the structural issues for me have uh, little to do with social political issues. Um, it's more to do with the experience um, and the fact that um, more and more sophisticated consumers are looking for differentiated experiences and you don't have that anymore in Hong Kong. Um, so I think it'll remain a hub, but it's a structural market share loser. Uh, as a joke at HSBC, we've been uh, publishing on this idea that the new TST, I don't know if you're familiar with TST, TST is one of the bigger neighborhoods where many mainland shoppers buy in Hong Kong, and we've been uh, publishing on this idea that the new TST is Tokyo, Seoul, Taipei. Um, and I think that's the alternative in the region. Um, Europe right now, short term, thanks to currency, uh, is an alternative. Um, and then you have up and coming alternative um, destinations. As I said, the US is opening up pretty quickly. Australia, the Middle East, etc. So Hong Kong will remain a hub, but losing share, you're seeing more and more brands either renegotiating rents right now or closing stores altogether. Uh, and this is quite recent. You know, three months ago when you interviewed brand managers, they said, yes, the situation will have us uh, renegotiate rents and put pressure on the landlords. Now they're actually threatening or actually just uh, plainly thinking of shutting a few stores. Uh, Macau's a bit different. Um, I think the issues of Macau are just a lag effect from the anti-corruption campaign in China. Um, and I, obviously Macau is quite miserable right now. But I, I think what Macau has that Hong Kong doesn't have anymore is under capacity in terms of stores. Uh, there are too many stores in Hong Kong. You could argue you could have more stores in Macau, uh, despite everything that's going on today. So for example, uh, from memory, you have about four Vuitton stores in Macau when you have about five in Vegas. The four in Macau are doing five times the business that the five in Vegas are uh, generating for wow. Vuitton. So theoretically, all the openings that are coming now in Macau with the new casino uh, okay. operators, Galaxy, et cetera, et cetera. Um, the metrics won't be as good, uh, but they're coming from being incredibly positive. They'll be just slightly mm -hmm. less positive. I'm, I'm less uh, uh, pessimistic about the future of Macau. 
I'd like to just rebound on what you said uh, yesterday. As you know, it's Fashion Week and lots of brands are organizing events. And I went to uh, a little event organized by Moana, M-O-Y-N-A-T, which is uh, one of these you know, old brands that are being resuscitated. And it's uh, what people call uh, Bernard Arnault's startup, uh, the founder and CEO of LVMH. Uh, it's quite an interesting uh, leather uh, bag brand. And he said that he just opened a boutique in Hong Kong in January. And he said in three days, he sold what he expected to sell in two months. So I think that kind of, you know, tells us volumes about the appetite that people in Hong Kong have for new old brands, but kind of newcomers th that uh, have a heritage. And I just thought I'd share this with you. I think there's another question from Madame here, no? Yes? I just wondered how, from um, a small street in Florence, you had this incredible grasp of the uh, Chinese market. The, uh, her, her way so early, you approached with Weibo, with WeChat, your visuals, your your artistic and your uh, your your artistic presence, which s shows an acute understanding of the Chinese market, and it's been so successful for you. How did that happen in Florence? Because I believe it was all about you. I didn't understand exactly what you're asking me. <laughs> oh, I'm sorry. Can I'm you speak hurry. louder? From the very beginning, you've had a very clear understanding of the Chinese market. You've developed WeChat and Weibo. You've done, you've done uh, all sorts of advertising and presentations. You've had a, uh, an event in Hong Kong. But you did it all yourself from Florence. How did you do that? You didn't employ big agencies, I understand. You, you did it. No, we, 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 we like to do everything in, in, in house, exactly, because I like to have full control. You know, have a big responsibility to war, toward all the big designers that we represent. So we have to guarantee them that everything that we do, we handle ourselves. And this has uh, been a, a decision uh, that uh, it was forced in one way, because when I started f uh, our activity online in the 1999, uh, it was nothing uh, happening in, in Florence and very little in Italy. So I didn't have the chance to, uh, as I said before, to use um, uh, outsourcing. So uh, everything is done uh, within our own people from the platform where uh, our um, website, you know, uh, work up until the delivery. Uh, everything is done by ourselves. And I believe this is a, you know, specific formula, but it works for us. You know, we, we, we have difficulties in uh, keeping up with the, with, with the orders, you know, especially from China, uh, which is growing so much, you know. Now, we, we've also launched uh, um, LVR, LVR, because for Chinese people to uh, 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 spell Luisa via Roma is too difficult, you know? Mm -hmm. <laughs> so, uh, By how much has your Chinese business grown in the past three years? I don't know exactly. I, I mean, I don't even have the time to look uh, at the percentage. <laughs> Anyway, I think we have. That's <laughs> great. Um, I, I think but we have I, to. Um, yeah, sorry. I tell you, it's mm. it's uh, it's uh, almost as much as we do in the U.S., which has always been uh, for, for, for forever the, the, our biggest market. Okay, I think we have to to cut it here. Um, uh, unless anybody has any burning uh, must ask question. Sorry, take a little bit of time. Uh, I actually have a very interesting question for the gentleman, uh, Amas. Uh, as everybody knows, like, Amas right now is uh, the symbol of status. So uh, we actually deal with lots of high network Chinese, and almost 18% of women carry Amas back. But I'm not sure how many are real, but I'm sure. But there's one. <laughs> uh, actually, even for the rich one, they sometimes also buy the fake one. So anyway. Uh, there's, but there's one phenomenon in the last one year, I think maybe two years, is a brand called a Bling Bling Sister. I'm not sure everybody here know. This brand actually is uh, founded by uh, second rich generations. This girl, uh, she basically exactly copied Kelly version and she only sell Kelly and uh, Birkin version, 
but in a very Ke innovative. Kelly and Birkin, right? Yeah, they only sell these two models, but mm -hmm. in a very innovative and funky way. So the bag is run cost uh, um, something around 500 euro to 600 euro. Um, but however, she understand you know the the, the rising of the Chinese uh, e-commerce like WeChat. So she actually used um, WeChat use like you know the uh, word of mouth to help sell sell this bag. Um, my f actually she's one of connection my connection. Um, she claims she sold 10 million RMB gross revenue in the last one year. So I was like actually really shocking because I don't know first of all whether her math like you know, uh, know the situation and how can like you know because she exactly copy how this can you know could happen like her uh, with a kind of notice um, or stop this situation so T tell me the name again <laughs> uh, it's called bling bling sisters okay yes so i'll Great i'll name. i'll call the uh, legal department <laughs> Because uh, it's well, been a year already. You yeah. know, you know, um, it's 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 nothing new to say that counterfeiting is absolutely uh, terrible for for creative uh, brands. Uh, the Kelly bag was designed by my grandfather in 1935. It's an identified model. It's all property. It's coming from the history of the brand, from the roots of this company, um, and and we know the creator uh, uh, and and this model has been so much copied, imitated, uh, counterfeited, and so on. Birkin was designed by my uncle in 1983. Same story. So it's really Hermes creation, and, and we are going to fight. We are fighting uh, against any counterfeiting or imitation uh, the much as we can. But but um, the um, way the, yeah. the, you know, it's, I think it's um, Gabriel Chanel who said, uh, I don't exactly uh, remember the exact words, but when you are copied, it's because you are successful. Yes. The biggest compliment, really, isn't it? Yes, but, but still we are fighting. Like so for us, bling, plagiarism bling, bling, bling is the biggest compliment. Okay. Well, well, yeah, just for information, I think this brand is a kind of a trademark already, like a registered already. So, anyway, just. <laughs> wow. Interesting. Well, I'd like to thank all our panelists uh, for uh, the richness of uh, their comments.